Hello viewers, welcome back to the lab. Uh, so you might notice that the paint box has disappeared off my workbench. Um, that's taken a temporary move into another room um, because there's a few things I need my workbench for. Uh, now, uh, there's a few repairs for the paint box. Um, those are coming up. But in the meantime, we have a teardown. We've not done a teardown in quite a while, especially not something like this. Um, so it'd be really nice to uh, do an old school teardown. So first off, I just want to thank my patrons for all their support. Uh, and I would also like to thank PCB Way for sponsoring this episode. PCB Way can manufacture your custom PCB designs, even if it's short run or production. With an easy to use website to configure your PCB build with all the manufacturing options you could possibly need. I've used PCB Way myself. I know they offer excellent value and service for PCB manufacturing. Maybe you're not ready to design your own PCB yet, but you want to make some projects. Well, they have their shared projects area with thousands of community designs all ready to order. Take a look at their website and find out more. So I picked this up uh, fairly recently. Um, I saw it on eBay and there was a few things inside which I noticed and I thought, oh, that might be um, a good one to pick up, do a teardown on and possibly recover some parts out of it. So uh, this massive great big box is a Packard flow scintillation analyzer. Uh, so what this is, it detects um, radioactive fluids um, and it's actually, because it's called a, flu a flow scintillation analyzer, um, it means that the, the fluid is actually flowing through a, uh, what is probably like a cuvette, um, where very, very small parts of it are, are sampled as it flows through. I've done liquid scintillation analyzers before, um, but they were, the liquid that was actually placed inside a capsule and then placed into the machine. Whereas this actually, it flows through the machine. So uh, this is a scintillation analyzer. So the fluid will be radioactive with a scintillation thing, um, probably in with the solution. Um, and then this just measures the, um, the very, very low levels of light that come out of it. And before anybody asks, um, I have been over this um, th quite thoroughly with my um, radiation contamination meter. Uh, there is no residual radiation in this. Um, I've been over very, very carefully and there's nothing in it at all, which is anything more than background radiation. So uh, it's a big, massive box. Uh, it's all it's all metal construction. A few controls on the front uh, with some little LED indicators in the front. These are just horrible push buttony things. Um, it's like a membrane keypad thing. There's no indicators on the front. There's lots of uh, stickers and stuff on the front here. Where these have come from, I don't know. Um, ISO count limited. That, I don't know, that looks like um, a company that maybe services them or rents them out or something. Yeah, not a lot to see on the front. Um, if I turn this around and show you the back, so there's not much up at the top here, just the sticker saying um, what model number it is, um, if the voltage it runs on. Uh, we've got a number of pipes that come in and out. Um, so we have radioactive waste and a non-radioactive waste. Um, we've got a pipe here with uh, some fluid in it, um, but that is fine, I've checked that already. Um, it was probably flushed through quite thoroughly. I would imagine that has to be done all the time anyway. Um, and there's a, another pipe here. Um, now, interestingly, in the back, this is the thing that sparked my um, attention, is we have a, a back plane with some cards plugged in, which look very much like um, PC interface cards. So we will certainly be um, interested to see what's exactly inside this. So uh, let's take the lid off. Uh, this just slides back. There's a couple of screws here which you can tighten to secure it, but um, it just comes off like this. And here we have the inside. So um, this assembly here, which is on like little runners and can actually separate out um, with some of the pipes that actually run to it. Now I suspect that there was um, some kind of flow chamber, which is uh, sandwiched in between these. 
and then these are done up and it all clamps together um, and that's why these can move about freely a little bit we've got a, a weird pump arrangement on here um, that seems to be adjustable in some way um, we've got lots of very very small capillary pipes um, I would imagine this is probably bordering on the lines of the um, HPLC, the high pressure liquid chromatography stuff that goes on with all these very, very fine capillary pipes, which work at a, a very, very high pressure, but very, very slow flow rate. Um, there's a little control panel on the back here. We have do not change cells when red light is on, but high voltage HV is going to be high voltage on and off, uh, pressure reset, uh, pressure cut out tripped and pump on and off auto so pretty basic stuff so you can see the uh, other side of the pump we've got some kind of sensory thing in there um, of old pipes not sure what that was for cavity something there I wonder whether that had something in it so not a huge amount to see on here there's some kind of valve or, or switch pressure sensor or something just in there so uh, for clarity these will be two um, fairly large photo multipliers um, these are used a lot in this kind of thing, uh, where you need to detect very, very low levels of um, visible or non-visible light. Uh, so we've got um, one, two, three connections on that one, and again, three connections on this one. So um, these will work in parallel. Um, the reason why there's two um, is because it helps to improve the sensitivity of the machine. In the base of this machine, I'm just going to open this up. It's not really meant to fold out like this. There's actually a stand, and you're actually meant to uh, put it on the stand like that. But uh, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to open it all the way up. So here on the underside of the, the actual sensor table thing, um, we have uh, the connections coming in from the photo multipliers. So we've got um, two BNCs um, on a large coax here and two smaller ones just here. Now what I suspect is actually happening here is... Um, one will be supplying the um, supply voltage to the photo multipliers and one will actually have the, the actual signal. I suspect this board is some kind of preamp for the signal, I think. So these two boards probably do things like uh, signal conditioning, probably the discrimination and stuff like that. And then that is then sent down here, uh, which is quite clearly the um, digital processing section. So uh, there is quite a bit going on in here. Um, we have uh, the back of the mains plug. We've got a random screw. Um, this down here looks like we've got um, an, an ISA single board computer um, so we've got a few cards plugged into a back an ISA backplane um, which one is the computer probably this one because it's got some are they 30 or 72 pin sims so um, we've got one two three four boards plugged into it this bit down here which you probably can't see um, too clearly is the high voltage photo multiplier power supplies uh, we've got a big transformer just here and another 
chassis power supply just there as well. So I bet that does all the sort of mechanical stuff with the, you know, maybe the pump, um, possibly powering the photo multiplier power supply. And that is probably doing the actual PC computer stuff. So what I'm going to do is remove the cards out of here. Going on here. Where do they go? So that's going to the high voltage power supply. Uh, we've got coax coming from somewhere. This cable runs out to some kind of sensor. That cable runs out to a DIN connector. So this board is quite kind of interesting because it looks like it's fairly modular. Um, we've got these plug-in boards. This might be some kind of addressable controller, so you can have different modules plugged into it to control different things, maybe. A Burr Brown DAC 725P digital to analog converter, which means that might be right in terms of this is an output module to allow you to control things. Right. Next card to come out is Rick again. Um, and we've got loads of EEPROMs. I wonder whether that, I must admit, um, if this is a single ball computer, where's the storage? I can't see any hard disk or any kind of, or you know, flash RAM, something like that. Um, so I wonder whether it's actually in ROM. So it'd be kind of interesting to see what is on those um, EEPROMs. Again, Packard Instrument Co. Uh, and Rick. So, doesn't reveal a huge amount. We've got a little buzzer there. Um, some dip switches, adjustments, lots of connectors for interfacing in. So this is obviously some kind of interface card like, like, well, uh, like that first one. So. So these are possibly the input and output cards. So you'd have the signals coming in from the actual for the actual analysis, and then you'd have other cards to control all the stuff to make it happen. Uh, so yes, indeed, we have a very small 16-bit. Um, ISA single board computer running a 386SX25 so not massively powerful by any means so this is the power supply for the photo multipliers but it also looks like it's some kind of distribution unit as well so there's a lot of power comes in here and lots of things go out of it so let's just rip it all off Right. Took a bit of effort to get that off. Um, so I think what this is uh, doing, it's like you've got a bit of power distribution sort of comes in here, powers this, and also then distributes out to all the other bits that need power. That's why we've got so many connectors on it. Right, so uh, with most of those cards taken out, um, I think what we'll do now is flip it back, we'll take these bits off, and then hopefully we can drag all the wires through and actually get this stripped down completely. So that is the pump um, made by Fluid Metering Inc. in USA. Um, piston, oh, okay there's ratings on here, probably depending on the size of the piston. I'm not sure what's in it of course, um, but it's saying flow range 0 to 65, then 0 to 130, and then 0 to 260 millilitres per minute, and the pressure is up to 100 psi so that is that looks like 
it's all quite adjustable. Right, because I got all covered in something there, I've just been to wash my hands and I've actually got my um, radiation meter. It's really good for testing stuff like this because it has such an enormous detector and it does alpha as well. So I just want to make sure there's nothing. That's fine, nothing more than background. Right, I'm gonna go and get some gloves anyway. Right, that's better. Uh, so, let's see. You, there's definitely fluid still in this. It's all oozed out the back. But it's probably just water. I would have thought. So, uh, one of the pipes. Some tissue paper. Hello everybody, so uh, there's a lot happened that you are not aware of. Um, the first part to this video I actually made four weeks ago and this has been sat on my bench ever since waiting for me to finish off making the video. So um, this is me trying to catch up um, and get finished on looking at this um, flow scintillation analyzer that we we're looking at uh, um, to you, it was uh, literally just a few moments ago, but for me it was four weeks ago, so my apologies. So we've got all the bits out of the actual box, the box is gone. Um, so what we're going to do is have a, a little bit of a look at uh, the components that we've got left um, and see if there's anything here that we might be able to salvage or take a look at in a, a future video. So um, here we've got the ISA backplane. Um, this is a, uh, a pretty standard bit of kit. Um, you can actually still buy this model. Um, it's actually still available. Um, they, they're not expensive, um, but that's probably, probably worth keeping because I might be able to pick up um, some other single board computer, which this might be useful for. So that is a very um, standard ISA backplane. Um, you've got power connectors, the uh, keyboard connector, um, and then the 16-bit uh, ISA slots. So the way these work is uh, if you've got a single board computer, then um, this is essentially the motherboard, and then you plug in the CPU, and then you plug in the other cards. So the whole CPU and the, its memory, the BIOS, and all that sort of stuff is on a plug-in card, not actually integrated onto the actual um, main board itself if you can call it that. So that is what the ISA backplane is. These have been around for a very very long time. Um, you can get them in 8-bit um, ISA, 16-bit, um, there's more modern versions that have PCI and all that sort of stuff. Um, it was it's quite a, a more modular way of making a PC that was often used in, in industry. So uh, you just put in the backplane um, and then you can just plug in whatever CPU card you want. It doesn't really matter. 
Um, so things can be upgraded or changed later um, and you don't have to worry about changing the actual motherboard. Uh, next up is the power supply. Um, this is a Power One um, branded unit. Um, fairly decent make that. Um, it's universal input, is it? Where is it? <laughs> Doesn't actually say. <laughs> Um, but I would imagine it is. It's a switching power supply, and they most always are. Um, the outputs, we've got um, one, two, three, four, five outputs. On pin one, we've got plus 12 volts at one amp. Pin two, minus 12 volts at one amp. Pin three, plus 12 volts at two amps. Pin four is ground. Um, oh, sorry, four and five. And pin six and seven is plus five at 14 amps. So a pretty standard um, chassis power supply that, um, probably useful to keep that, might, might be useful for something. Uh, we've got the um, photo multipliers um, still in its mount, so uh, we'll have a look at that in a moment. So let's have a look at some of the other cards. Um, this was the power distribution board, I think, wasn't it? So the power supply plugged in here, and then this obviously distributes the power out to all the other components. Um, but it also has on it the um, two power supplies for the photo multipliers, because they're gonna need, um, what, at least a sort of 700 volts minimum, um, and they might go up to like maybe 1200, something like that. So, um, you often find um, potted modules like this um, for driving photo multipliers because they're an off the shelf unit. Um, you stick them on your board and then you can usually control the output voltage um, uh, electronically. Um, so the actual um, the software on the machine will be able to adjust this depending on settings and things like that. So we've got two uh, parallel outputs. Um, these uh, will be the photo multiplier um, power supplies. So they'll generate a high voltage, but very, very low current. Um, so those are made by MCO and they are model 7960. So yeah, you can see there, there's, there's actually only, is there only four connections on each one? It looks like it actually. So they might not be controllable. It might just be a, a, a set, a set output, possibly. So the outputs of those two uh, will come out to um, a couple of little passive components, um, some high voltage capacitors. You can see they're all covered in black gunk, which often happens when you have uh, high voltage stuff. And then eventually it comes out to some high voltage BNC style connectors. Um, which then run over coax to the actual photo multiplier. So these will certainly be, uh, be worth replacing because all the cables uh, will be high voltage rated BNCs. So they will all mate with these and then nicely um, just panel mount. So those I will definitely be saving. So yeah, not a lot to see on that. It's just a power supply um, module. So next up we have the uh, single board computer. Now, I had suspected that this would have actually used a completely off-the-shelf single board computer because why would it need to be anything special? But it looks like um, that's what this is. It's uh, something that's been customised. Um, as I said, I, sus I was expecting to find a completely standard uh, module, but um, this is actually, um, even though this looks like a chips um, design, um, and I'm sure there was something on, yeah. Um, yeah, we've actually got a chips sticker on there. 386, blah, 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 et cetera. So I had uh, thought this might be standard, but it's not. It's actually, you can see in the a, um, on the PCB here, we have Packard. So this has obviously been customized by Packard in some way. Um, to suit to this particular machine, which I find actually quite interesting. Um, but aside from that, it looks like a fairly standard um, single board computer. We have um, 
two, four, six, eight, um, 30 pin SIM slots uh, with only two uh, SIMs actually installed. Those are one megabyte each. So uh, we've just got two megabytes on here. Um, next along here, we've got uh, the actual CPU, which is um, hopefully you can see there, a 386SX and what speed is that? It's a 25 megahertz 386. So not a very fast machine by any means. Um, so we've got the usual PC um, support chips and stuff, uh, battery backup. Um, there will be a floppy and possibly an IDE controller. That looks like floppy and that looks like IDE, I think. Um, that is a nine pin header, so that's probably serial. Um, yeah, it's quite easy to uh, pull out detail on this sort of stuff. Um, now, the what I had expected to see on this was a completely standard BIOS. Uh, you know, your American Mega Trends, that kind of thing. But there's no mention of that on here. There's just some um, a paper sticker over this, which is probably where the BIOS is. Um, so I kind of suspect this has a custom BIOS on it um, or some custom software. So I suspect this is not going to be PC compatible. What it's actually doing, I don't really know. Um, I think at some point I might look at trying to power it up and see what actually happens. Um, but given that there's no VGA output on this, um, that could be an issue. It probably doesn't expect to have any kind of video output. Um, so I would have to plug a, a VGA card in as well but then that might not work because it doesn't have a pc bios so we'll have to see what happens on that one what could be happening is it works with this card so what i'm wondering is the bios has been replaced and changed for something else um, and what that does is if you um, had a some software located elsewhere in the address space, you could then tell the BIOS to go to it and start running the code that is, runs the machine. Now, interestingly, on this board, we have um, four um, fairly large EEPROMs with obviously the software on. So um, I, I wonder whether this has been slightly modified in that its BIOS has been changed. So. In instead of trying to boot as a PC would, it would literally just start executing code and that's the software in here. Carrying on with this board, uh, we've got the what is obviously the software installed in EEPROM. These are 27C512 EEPROMs. So that will give you uh, 64 kilobytes each and we have four of them. So that gives us a total of 256 kilobytes of program storage. Um, interestingly, there is actually a, another backup battery on here, um, in addition to the one that's on the CPU. Um, so, yeah, interesting that they have two. Um, so you can see there we've got uh, 3.6 volts, 180 milliamp hour. So I would imagine those are probably rechargeable. So there is obviously some... Um, static RAM or something on here that's actually keeping settings and things like that when the machine's powered off. This device here is an ST16C452CJ um, and that is a dual um, asynchronous uh, UART so that's um, like a serial port. Um, so okay this Next card along is um, this one here. Not really sure what this one's doing, but this one certainly took a lot of connections out to the other boards. So I wonder whether this is part of the um, sort of the control and feedback and all that sort of stuff um, and receiving data from the various bits on the, the rest of the machine. So, or we've got lots of um, headers for, for all the cables and stuff that we pulled out. Um, it's got two FPGAs, an EEPROM, oh sorry, three FPGAs and an EEPROM and some other support logic. Uh, dip switches, a buzzer. So I think this is obviously doing a fair bit of the processing, whatever that is actually entails. 
Um, we've got more ports, and again, um, one of them was covered up. That's a 15-way connector. Whether that's VGA, I have no idea. I suspect it probably wouldn't be. So the EEPROM is a 27C256. Uh, um, so that's a 32K EEPROM. Um, so not a lot in there. Um, the FPGAs. The FPGAs are Xilinx um, XC3030A. Uh, right, those are a, a 2000 gate FPGA. Um, they require um, about 22,000 configuration bits to configure them, which means you could fit three configuration um, bit streams into that um, EEPROM. So that is possibly uh, where the program is actually stored for these FPGAs. Um, next card along. Um, so I think when we took this out, we speculated this is uh, some kind of um, digital to analog control system. So the it plugs into the ISA backplane. So this is um, possibly addressed by the software. And there's four modules or up to four modules on here. So I would imagine that um, this is addressable and you can then command various control voltages to go out to things to control them or switch them or do something to actually operate the rest of the, of the machine. Um, there's only two modules installed. What these are actually doing, I'm not entirely sure. Um, there's a Burr Brown um, digital to analog converter on this one. So I think it's quite clear that's um, generating some uh, analog voltages um, under the control of the software and um, it looks like this can take um, up to four modules connectors i can't remember what was actually connected up now because as i said before it was four weeks ago when i started looking at this so yes not a massive amount to see but um, it looks like this is probably addressed um, through the isa bus um, this card is one of the uh, what looks to be uh, a pair that actually operate the actual analog side, the actual receiving the data and processing it from the photo multipliers. What they're actually doing, it's it's very very hard to tell. There is um, an analog to digital converter on there, so that's digitizing something. We've got the two coaxes coming in, so it might be some kind of um, feedback or something or I don't th it might even be the actual um, signal that you want to actually um, capture um, but that could also be on here as well it's hard to tell so we've got two uh, BNC's on this one um, we've got two parallel channels coming in um, so yeah not really sure yeah, so we've got two ADCs on here, just here. No, I've actually just checked. Um, these are actually AD96685BQs, and they are actually high-speed comparators. So um, they take a differential signal in and then give you a, um, um, a logic output. So they're not actually analog to digital converters um, so that might be something to do with the discrimination um, I spoke about this before um, and it's a way to improve your signal to noise ratio when you're working with photo multipliers in this before I've, I've seen stuff like this before so that might be what this is doing a bit so uh, that is all the boards looked at let's have a look at the photo multiplier so there was two of these in the machine. Um, as I said before, um, discrimination is a thing. Um, so generally you have two photo multipliers looking at the same sample and um, you can use that to uh, improve your signal to noise ratio and discriminate against background noise and the actual sample that you want to um, detect. So these are housed in an aluminium tube um, with um, some mounting plates got three connectors on the back um, COIN um, sign and the, the other ones unlabeled um, that I think is the high voltage input 
Um, these are quite heavy um, because there's a chunk of lead around the front here. Um, so that's obviously used for a bit of shielding. And there's some O-rings on here, so I think this would have clamped, the two um, detectors would have clamped together with the flow chamber or something that would have been in front of these two photo multipliers. So we've got some remains of the plumbing on the top here. This should just pull out. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of what I expected to see. Um, got the photomultiplier tube um, with some what the, this uh, metal shielding around here will be uh, mu metal and is uh, reduces magnetic interference because uh, of course these are electron tubes so they are deflected by magnetic fields so, um, so that the photo multiplier is plugged into a socket and then we've got the voltage divider network which you see on photo multipliers um, just on the back there so we should be able to remove this out of here. Yeah. Okay, looks like there's a bit more lead shielding in the back there. Yeah, that's pretty soft. So yeah, we've got a, um, a photo multiplier with a frosted, frosted dome uh, on the end, so we can't really see inside it. And surprise, surprise, we've got a Hamamatsu tube um, R331-08. Right, uh, there's nothing more to see now. Um, the uh, other photo multiplier will be identical, of course. Oh, there was the pump, um, but yeah, it's not really that interesting to look at. Um, it's obviously variable because it's got a um, an adjustable thing on the end here, so it probably has a. You can control the flow, the flow rate. Um, there is actually an encoder on the back of it, but these will be very. Um, They'll pump only very, very tiny amounts of liquid here. Yeah. Flow range, oh, it depends on the model. So um, RHB, doesn't actually say which model it actually is. Um, but the smallest one is 0 to 65 millilitres per minute. So um, yeah, it's uh, only very, very small amounts. Um, oh, RH00, there we go. So... Yeah, that is the slowest one. So, I presume you can set the actual rate using this. Yep. So, I hope you found this one interesting. Um, if you did, give it a thumbs up and a like and all that good stuff. Uh, and there'll be more videos coming along very soon. Okay, bye for now.